Today I'm going to talk about homicide mens rea. And so you, through TV or through movies, have probably heard uh, first degree murder, second degree murder, manslaughter, all these phrases get thrown around. Uh, but you might not have realized until uh, today's readings that when we talk about degrees of uh, murder, or if we talk about the difference between murder and manslaughter, uh, the difference is just one of mens rea. So the act requirements for our homicides are universal across all these different uh, distinction divisions. It's mens rea uh, that's dividing uh, the, the seriousness of the crime in terms of um, how it's punished and how it's prosecuted um, in our system. Um, so to start with, we have a, a distinction between murder and manslaughter. That's our first two, uh, two big categories. Uh, and these categories exist in both the model penal code uh, uh, systems and in uh, common law derived ones. And it's sort of a matter of black letter law. We say murder means it includes malice aforethought. And manslaughter is no malice aforethought. But in truth, these aren't very helpful. Uh, um, descriptions, definitions, a anything like that. Because what is malice forethought? You know, we don't have clear indications from there. So instead, it's far more helpful to just skip this discussion of malice forethought and no malice forethought and jump right into what's required uh, based on the statutes and the supplemental doctrines that accompany them. Uh, so to that end, uh, we're going to turn first to murder uh, today. And we have three cases. Um, You'll notice that the difference between uh, the common law tradition and the MPC tradition in this area is that the common law wants to draw one extra distinction to make two major categories, what we associate with first-degree murder and second-degree murder. And admittedly, the real world will have different labels here uh, from time to time, but these are the ones we're going to stick with. Um, so the common law says we have first- and second-degree murder. The MPC says we just have murder, and it's inclusive of both of those. But overall, um, the category that the MPC recognizes as murder, it includes two subparts, right? As we see from the, the statute I took from Guam because it used the original language of the MPC, uh, it, it, it's just its two subparts are equivalent to the first and second degree murder. But the difference is the MPC drafters didn't really think this distinction was important to establish. Um, so the I mean, the, the jurors uh, will be instructed on both possible theories of murder if the prosecution uh, seeks, wants them to be, and they just return a guilty verdict to murder. In other words, the distinction is just a, a disjunctive list and like we see in many different statutes. This is in contrast to the common law where there's often been quite a bit of litigation, uh, including uh, two of our cases today, where uh, the defense is arguing, no, no, at worst I'm guilty of second-degree murder and not first-degree murder. Um, that sort of appeal doesn't happen in the MPC because the defendant would really just say, I'm guilty of murder but not murder, which doesn't make sense. They're both uh, considered the same because the NBC drafters didn't really think the distinction uh, that is drawn by the common law was particularly important or helpful. And that distinction um, relies on uh, um, this concept of premeditation deliberation. But first, let's, there's actually two different parts to first-degree murder. Uh, one is it's going to be an intentional homicide, meaning the person was trying to kill another. Uh, as I've mentioned in a couple of our cases, intent can follow the bullet. So if you do have a premeditated murder towards one person, miss and hit another, we can still say you had premeditated uh, murder against that bystander or secondary uh, person. Uh, so first-degree murder is always an intentional act uh, by a defendant. Um, and then it's going to involve premeditation and or deliberation. And you notice that the and or here is a little odd. Well, some jurisdictions actually treat premeditation and deliberation as separate related concepts. And of those, some emphasize deliberation, some emphasize premeditation. And then others just treat it as, as one. Or in the case of our, our Begay case, they they use just the word premeditation, but if you look at the definition of premeditation in the statute, one of the first words is deliberation. So we're just going to treat it as one unified concept. Premeditation, deliberation are going to mean the same thing, and it's going to require a specific type of evidence um, that's going to show that somebody um, was not just intending to kill the crime, but they had some opportunity uh, for reflection. They had uh, some moment of potential deliberation uh, that indicated they uh, still wanted to go through with this. 
And this idea of emphasizing premeditation deliberation was was focused a lot on some of the early um, retributive type theory, moral theories about wrongfulness. Um, some of these were very religiously reform, informed. The idea was that if somebody had a moment where they realized they that, where they could think, "Is this wrong? Should I go through with this?" and still decided to go through with the crime, that that made them worse uh, from a moral perspective versus merely intending to do it but not having that opportunity refer for reflection or deliberation. As we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, the NPC drafters don't think this is a very uh, clear and sound distinction. In truth, we'll probably save most of that discussion for class, and I won't uh, get it into further depth here in uh, the lecture. So that's our first degree murder category, or just the first subpart of the NPC. Um, the second degree murder category is a little, uh, you know, part of it's really easy and part of it's a little trickier. Um, and so, uh, you know, I put here in the slide a cold heart because, in fact, second degree murder is often associated with very colorful language. And so cold hearted, depraved hearted, lots of things about the heart. Uh, there's a lot of different euphemisms and terms that are used to describe the same basic concept. Um, this idea of, you know, extreme indifference to human life. And that's how the NBC drafters did. They moved away from these sort of colorful um, uh, similes. And instead, they said, committed recklessly under circumstances manifesting extreme indifference to the value of human life. So extreme indifference. And you also notice the word recklessly there. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, talk about that in a second because this is not ordinary reckless and that's important to recognize because you have to look at the whole clause um, and so second degree murder can be proven in one of two ways and sometimes students forget about the first one but it's important to highlight any intentional murder that didn't meet the premeditation or deliberation requirement of first degree murder then drops down to second degree murder so you're always going to have sort of this fallback intentional homicide murder uh, that second degree murder when you lack uh, premeditation deliberation. But then it's that second part uh, that is the, the trickier one, which is the depraved heart, uh, the cold heart, um, or the extreme indifference to human life. And whatever the statutory language here, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. It's the same basic concept. But as I said, the, the word reckless here in the NPC version of it can sometimes mislead you. And it also appears in some common law variations because you might just think, well, okay, I'll just take my definition of reckless. Uh, which means you're taking a substantial and unjustified risk and ignoring it, and a gross deviation from uh, a law-abiding, reasonable person. Um, but no, it's got to be more than that. And so at the most basic level, you might just think of second-degree murder through this depraved heart extreme indifference as sort of super recklessness. And I know that sounds, you know, a little too colloquial and not very helpful, but I, I, students have found it, you know, to, to you know, be um, um, at least somewhat informative as to distinguishing ordinary recklessness, criminal recklessness, uh, from this, this category of depraved heart. Uh, because it's really just not caring whether or not a, another person lives or dies. Um, but it's not going to be as high as, say, knowingly, because knowingly in the NBC is captured under the sub-1 part of the statute, because it says any murder that is purpose or knowingly. So knowingly would be practical certain uh, that, say, someone would die depraved heart or extreme indifference is it's not quite practically certain, but your actions reflect a, a total indifference to whether or not somebody lives or dies. So two, two classic sort of quintessential examples of um, second degree murder by depraved heart or extreme indifference are shooting into a crowd. And we saw that in a Riley case before, and I sort of foreshadowed that's, that's one that can fit there. Um, possibly, you know, if you're shooting into a crowd, or driving into a crowd. Um, so in both cases, a lethal weapon, a gun, or a car is being used in a way that it's, you know, it's not practically certain somebody's going to die. As we saw in a Riley case, no one died. In fact, cars can drive through crowds, as we've seen in some of the protests in, in recent times, and not kill anyone. Of course, there have been fatalities sometimes. And so it's not going to reach that knowledge level. It's not going to be practically certain that a death will result. Uh, but the recklessness uh, shows an indifference to human life because you are, are taking a lethal weapon and putting it into a crowd. You don't care whether or not anyone lives or dies. It's you're basically indifferent to it. And that's what the language is really trying to draw out there. So those are our two common law categories, first and second degree murder, and they get swallowed up into the PC version, which says intentionally and knowingly, that's our 
our intentional uh, type murders that would normally be first degree murder uh, if the common law were, you know, that's the parallel um, structure. And then the second one is this uh, depraved heart, uh, the sort of uh, reckless indifference to human life. Okay, so the MPC, as I said, you just don't, you know, the, this focus on planning, premeditation, deliberation, preparation, it's just secondary, right? That evidence can be used to prove purpose, right? If you are planning a homicide, that is strong evidence of conscious object purpose. So, yeah, I mean, the same evidence is still in play. It's still going to be used by the prosecution, but it's not necessary for the homicide charge because this whole analysis of premeditation deliberation, as we'll see in our first two cases, is is not necessarily um, clear and it's confusing. And modern courts have really expanded what it can include. So it's not even as limited a category as maybe as it once was. Another difference is, you know, historically, and as you can even see referenced in the, the Arkansas case, we associated first-degree murder with being death penalty eligible. That's why they call it capital murder in Arkansas. Uh, but in fact, in some states, secondary murder is also death penalty eligible. So the distinction between the two in some common law jurisdictions has become uh, less important even at the sentencing stage. So even if a person's guilty of secondary murder, they might face the same sentence as if they've been found guilty of first degree. Okay, so our first case, Begay, um, you know, is, is a simple fact pattern on one front, right? We have, you know, two people or, or, or two cars, vehicles on the side of the road, um, and a person gets out from one and shoots into the other. But the, the issue here is mens rea, and there is some confusion about what the defendant was doing. We, we actually have very little understanding of, say, his motive, um, what was going through his mind during the time that he uh, had first approached the other vehicle, then gone back to his truck, and then come uh, w returned with his gun. I mean, what, what exactly was going on there? Um, you know, there is one footnote I've included here just for, for clarity's sake that Begay is a common name uh, in the Navajo Nation. So, in fact, uh, several people in this case have the same last name, but uh, the court uh, uh, says they're not related. And so they use first names, which is a little unusual, or initials uh, um, at certain points here. So uh, that's, that's just an, uh, you know, interesting anthropological uh, oddity from this perspective of the court. But it recognizes that different cultures and backgrounds have different common names, and Begay is a common name among Navajo. So in this case, as I said, we have these two cars pass each other, but there doesn't seem to be any like triggering road rage incident, which you know, we might think has, has been going on here, that in other words, maybe the car with the victim had done something to offend, cut off, or otherwise disturb um, uh, the defendant, but we don't, there's, no one can point to any clear evidence there. Um, we also don't have any prior contact. These people aren't known to each other. And yet, at the end of um, you know, the, the crime, uh, our defendant has fired their gun, uh, a 30 caliber rifle, uh, eight or nine times into uh, the other vehicle. And why is a bit of a mystery. But since this is a common law jurisdiction, it's the federal system, which follows the common law approach to mens rea here, um, there we have to decide, is this first-degree murder because there's premeditation deliberation, or is it second-degree murder because they, it lacks premeditation or deliberation? Uh, because it definitely seems intentional, right? You, he's gotten his gun, he's fired eight to nine times into the passenger side of the vehicle. I mean, they, that's not, sh say, shooting into a crowd or something like this. This is an intentional uh, type crime, and that's what the jurors said. Um, the jurors, though, also felt that it was uh, premeditated, and that is where our um, panel here splits. And this is an en banc panel, meaning in most circuits, this would be the entire circuit, all active judges in the circuit, and any senior judges that were on the original panel. But since it's the Ninth Circuit, they actually do a random draw of uh, about half the circuit along with the original panel. And so that's why you have so many judges in the dissent. Um, but the majority here ultimately upholds this conviction. And as I highlight one of the discussion questions, this case reflects a modern trend. Because historically, uh, throughout a lot of the 20th century and a lot of the cases you'll see in other case books, will um, say that there has to be specific evidence of premeditation. In other words, there has to be evidence pointing to this sort of planning, uh, to uh, a strong motive, or towards an actual 
deliberation, meaning contemplation or something by the defendant. And so the dissent represents this traditional view. That's where Judge Reinhart is going through, you know, all this evidence and saying this has not been enough in the past, right? You wouldn't just be able to say the jurors can infer um, premeditation deliberation. The evidence would have to have greater specificity and be directly related to premeditation. And so Judge Reinhardt in the dissent goes through these sort of traditional types of evidence. So it's important to recognize the categories he talks about, even though it's a dissent, because the majority would agree that if these types of evidence existed, then you definitely should affirm here. So I, I've already mentioned a couple, but I want to want to elaborate on them and then add another. So uh, planning is absolutely uh, um, uh, evidence of premeditation, right? So if you, you know, have to do things in preparation to make the, the your your crime, your homicide unfold the way it does, uh, that planning itself uh, indicates premeditation. Uh, second category is motive. Um, so you know, motive, as I, I mentioned very early on, we talked about mens rea is not necessary, but in this case, it can be sufficient for proving mens rea. So if a uh, one uh, spouse kills another, um, we, we often don't think, well, that's not necessarily premeditated because, in fact, intimate partners are the, the most likely category of person to kill another. Sometimes arguments and fights escalate. But then you find out that one the spouse that killed the other took out an insurance policy on the other person, say, two weeks before the crime. Well, now we have a motive, right, a financial motive, and that changes the whole nature of the crime. We move from what could have been a second-degree murder or potentially, as we'll see, a, a, a form of manslaughter if it was in this really heightened um, heat of passion. But uh, if we don't have that heat of passion and instead we have this insurance policy, um, we think that's evidence of motive, and jurors can um, say that that indicates premeditation. A third important category, though, is the manner in which the crime is committed. Um, so sometimes this overlaps uh, with um, um, planning, but not always. Um, and so, for example, certain methods of crime uh, are highly indicative of premeditation. Uh, so a gun or a knife can be weapons of opportunity, is particularly if the guns are out. But knives in particular are often easily available. They don't indicate anything about somebody's mindset. But poison is something we associate more with premeditation, usually because it has to be you know, um, given to somebody surreptitiously without their knowledge. It's not as easy to acquire. It's not something that's available. So crimes that require you know, more than just what's lying around and um, are not uh, impulsive in nature, things like poisoning, can indicate uh, premeditation. And so these are sort of the categories that, that are often core parts of prosecutor's case under premeditation deliberation. And none of that exists here, right? None of that is in play. Uh, instead, uh, what the majority says, I mean, they break it down to first, second, third, and finally. And I, you know, these are, I appreciate both the majority and dissent sort of listing the arguments and separating them. Uh, but I, I want to just point at them holistically. They're all based on inferences, right? So, you know, even the, the first one that the court says the jury could reasonably infer um, that when he went to get the gun, you know, that was basically his premeditation. He was going back to the vehicle to get a weapon, so he's clearly thinking about it. And the case law has always been clear that premeditation can be formed in an instant. So it doesn't, doesn't mean you need like a long contemplative time or anything. The timing isn't the issue here. The, the problem and the, the difference between the majority and dissent is this inference, right? Because previously, and still in many jurisdictions, uh, the courts want more. They want something that's on point and specific as to uh, premeditation and deliberation. Um, so even the second um, category, you know, there was no evidence he was agitated or rushed. So in other words, the fact that he's not highly emotive, you know, that could be uh, premeditation. I, I really find this one especially um, uh, problematic uh, for supporting the verdict because, I mean, if he ran faster, would we say he's not premeditated? The fact that he walked deliberately, it's, it's tough. You can infer a lot of things from the pace that somebody's walking, and not all of them indicate uh, premeditation to commit uh, homicide. Uh, the fact that they went, he went to the passenger side uh, so that, that he could get a better shot at JT, who he'd spoken to, again, this is, this is something that 
was close, but I, historically had not been sufficient. But as the majority indicates, this is the rule now in, in the Ninth Circuit, and it's ref, it's uh, reflective of what other courts have done there as well. And then, as the slide is, there is this sort of what did you do interaction, and Begay told her to shut up and be quiet. And so this, uh, the the court says, could have been in indicating a cool mind. Again, something that's not very emotive. You know, I, all these are tough because several of them you could just say indicate intentionality and not premeditation. And those are different things, right? Intentional is one requirement, premeditation, deliberation, another. But the court says we, you know, if a rational juror can infer from these things collectively that, that there was premeditation, we're not going to overturn it. And so the dissenting judges here, though, go through it very differently and say a lot of things can be inferred from these same things, and a reasonable juror shouldn't have been able to find beyond a reasonable doubt. And so as I say in the, the notes here, this is sort of a, an edge case, right? This is where the law has moved, the envelope has been pushed, and so it could have come out either way. Judges are split here, and it will really depend on the jurisdictions and the precedent uh, that presently exists in that, that jurisdiction. Okay, then we get to another case, Thornton versus Arkansas. Now, this case presents a different problem um, because um, whereas we had surviving witnesses to tell us about what happened in Begay, uh, often in our homicide cases, we don't have any surviving eyewitnesses to the actual crime, right? You still have witnesses about the context and, say, one person hearing a neighbor hearing a gunfire here. Um, but this is, this is an inherent problem with homicide cases. The be best witness to the crime is dead and not available. And the other major witness, um, the person who committed the homicide, whether it's the defendant or not, uh, may not testify, may not give statements to the police. And even if they do, they might be self-interested and they might you know, distort reality or, or be a lie. And so uh, we have to piece together uh, what happened from a variety of circumstances here. One of the difficult things about Thornton uh, here and um, is that a lot of the facts and a lot of the testimony, and I, I, I've edited it down, but I wanted to give you a complete picture of um, the evidence because if the if I'm giving you a majority opinion that's saying there's not enough evidence for first degree here and they're going to uh, reduce it to second degree and therefore uh, reverse the jury's decision, I, I want to at least give you a full picture of the evidence as it existed. And yet you'll notice the evidence across the board here um, is really just focused on Thornton's guilt of causing the death of another, and very little is about uh, his premeditation. And we might even say, and I think it's worth discussing in class, is there even enough evidence here that he committed the homicide? Um, this is something that, you know, I think the evidence here is... It's limited um, to say that, right? There, there might be strong evidence linking Thornton's car to the disposal of the body, but it's not clear that means he pulled the trigger. There's some evidence that it might have been, you know, the the shot that was overheard by the neighbor, um, and if that, you know, testimony is credible there, um, that could have been it. But we don't know if anyone else was there. Um, and like Begay, though, so I, I talk about some differences, but like Begay, uh, we don't have a clear reason for this to occur. And in fact, Thornton and uh, Turner were long-term friends. And you'll notice there's no one testifying about a growing conflict or hate or a betrayal or anything like that. Um, you know, this is something that's mysterious about the case. And so ultimately, the majority says um, there's, there's just not really any evidence on um, premeditation deliberation here. Um, that's sufficient to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Whereas the dissent thinks there is. The dissent says we should just de um, defer to the jury verdict. But what is the evidence that the dissent points to, right, is sort of being evidence of premeditation as opposed to uh, merely his guilt or even his intentionality, right? Where is the evidence of premeditation? So one thing that's, that's an issue here is um, how the entry wound was delivered. So there's a single shot fired from behind into uh, the victim's head. And as um, the dissent wants to argue, and uh, at least the medical examiner floated, was this could be uh, evidence of an execution-style killing, uh, right? In other words, somebody could be on their knees, it could be from 
a higher trajectory, the gun's pointed down in the back of their head, and that kills them. And we associate sort of hitmen and these sort of execution-style clients. That's premeditated, right? Particularly you have somebody get down, and there's, there's strong reasons. But that's, there's no evidence Thornton's a hitman or you know, that, that why he would engage in an execution-style um, killing. But also, uh, and this is where the dissent majority framed the evidence differently, the medical examiner says this is only one of many possible scenarios. And the dissent says, well, you know, but we can trust the jurors found this one to be credible. But when your expert's saying that, yeah, it's consistent with that, but it could also be consistent with many other possible scenarios, it's difficult to say this is actually what happened beyond a reasonable doubt. And so this case helps to illustrate sort of what's called the CSI effect, um, what its actual effects in the real world is, are, are still up for debate. But the notion, at least among uh, you all as students, is uh, you've watched CSI, you've watched shows like it, and you often assume that the capabilities of forensic science and uh, examinations of the evidence at this level, like ballistics, is really hard science, and we get very clear pictures of what happened. Right? You often see these computer generation generated recreations Creations. Uh, everyone's very certain about um, how things unfold. It might take them a you know full forty minutes if we take out commercials to figure out how it happened. But by the end, we we have a clear picture. The real world is is far less uh, clear. Uh, forensic science is not um, nearly as is, is, uh, first rigorous and as accurate as you might hope. In fact, even the field of ballistics, which is often taken for granted in all these shows, is we can do a bullet match. Um, uh, you can't in, in many cases. And in fact, there's a lot of controversy where matches have been stated by experts and it contradicts FBI standards or later we discovered that that level of matching really didn't mean much at all. Um, these notions of grooves and things of the barrel of the gun, uh, creating grooves in the bullets. I mean, they're, they're just, there's, a, there's not a, a lot of consensus on what creates certainty in this area. And so when our expert here says this is a lot of different ways, well, that's significant, right? Um, there's also the fact that it's a single shot, which the dissent says, hey, it, it doesn't, you, we don't, one shot can be enough. And I think that's fair. But it doesn't, but the fact that there weren't more shots means that theory, you know, the sort of overkill or trying to make sure somebody's dead uh, when there's no evidence of sort of an emotional and, um, um, impulse, uh, that that could have been evidence of premeditation, but it doesn't exist here. And so, yeah, the dissent, you know, takes a, a very strong view of deferring to the jury verdict, but I think the majority is right here to think that um, there's just not strong evidence here of planning. Uh, there's not a motive, right? There's not the manner of the killing except for the possibility that it could have been execution style is, you know, really not helping here. Um, and there's no evidence of the motive or planning at all. So our typical evidence doesn't exist and the limit evidence that there is here, it's hard to say a reasonable juror could have decided beyond a reasonable doubt that this was first degree murder. So I think the majority is right. But again, you see a split, right? Different judges looking at the same evidence in different ways. And also this, this emphasis on specificity of the evidence versus allowing jurors to infer. That's in both Begay and Thornton. And you see the majorities come out in different directions between those two cases. Okay, then we move to Commonwealth v. Malone. And so this is an older case. Um, you know, I like to use modern cases, but this one I think is is a pretty good fact pattern for um, you know a depraved heart homicide uh, that's at least not just the driving into the crowd or shooting into the crowd. So it's something a little bit different. So you have those two possibilities, and this is something that you know is you know a, a problematic situation the fact that the victim is underage might make it you know seem much worse in, in our minds but that's not relevant to the guilt of our defendant here uh, the fact that this could have been a game that went awry means some people look at it and say well second degree that just seems too much but let's start by saying you know as we often want to do in any of our homicide cases we'll start at the top and work our way down so this cannot be first degree murder um, because it's not an intentional killing um, there is actually evidence of premeditation deliberation because there's this whole set of rules and there's a process that shows planning and the manner of killing is different, but it's not intentional, 
right? And this is because this, I mean, this is a version of what we now call Russian roulette, but they called Russian poker, at least in this case, and I included the footnote defining it. I want to say this is a version because, uh, of course, normally the game of Russian roulette, which isn't a game, it's a, it's a horrible activity, and, you know, it's something that people with death wishes or, or you know, severe uh, depression might might engage in, but it's not a, a fun game or something, something like that. Uh, but it's... Um, it's something that we normally would think the gun would trade hands, right? And if that had happened, uh, we'd have a very different way of examining the case because if uh, the gun was in William Long, the 13-year-old's hand when he pulled the trigger, we might think of that as an accidental suicide and not a homicide. We could discuss in class if there's another theory for it to be a homicide. But as it is, the gun stays in Malone's hand. So he's alternating where it's pointing, um, but uh, it's, it's never leaving his hand. So he is definitely meeting the act requirements of causing the death of another here. And Long, you, you know, says, I don't care, go ahead. Just to be clear, that evidence is irrelevant. Uh, as we'll talk about when we get to general uh, affirmative defenses, uh, you can't consent to uh, homicide. So even if you want to think this is consensual at some level, that is legally uh, irrelevant. Um, and of course, as we go through the chambers and the revolver here, uh, the odds change. Uh, so if this is a six-chamber revolver, right, you go through uh, six different uh, bullets, assuming one is, is not already loaded. But if, if there's just one bullet here in the six-chamber, start with the sort of one in six, one in five, one in four, um, and so on. By the last one, we could say, well, that, that is an intentional homicide, right, assuming that our defendant is, is uh, even halfway decent at math. Uh, but at this point... Um, uh, there's at least a chance it, it won't occur. So is this uh, second-degree murder? Does this show an extreme indifference to human life, a depraved heart, a cold heart? Um, now, I want to make it aside here. One worry, again, we have with any of these cases is the, the best witness is gone, and um, our, our, witnesses, uh, our witness here, defendant, did testify, uh, but his statements are self-serving um, in many ways, right? I, you know, it's hard to know for certain, but I imagine some judges and jurors could look at these statements and, and say, really, that's what happened, right? That, that he said, go ahead. And that after he shot him, Malone said, did I hit you, Billy? G, kid, I'm sorry. Um, it seems very almost polite uh, for the circumstances. Um, and, you know, Long did die two days later. He didn't die immediately. Um, but, uh, you know, and the defendant here claims, well, he didn't expect the gun to go off. Well, obviously the jurors rejected that, so we don't have to worry about that theory. But is there sufficient evidence here for this sort of um, malevolent wickedness? You'll notice all these adjectives thrown into the court's review of Blackstone and other cases here, um, wantonly, recklessly, in disregard of the consequences. You see the mention of the car into a crowd. And they ultimately say, yeah, this is, this is enough, right? Because it's not about necessarily the odds at any given moment, right? If this had been a 20-chambered um, gun, uh, like an extended magazine, but uh, you didn't know where it was placed in it or something like that, um, you know, that's not really what's important, right? It's the fact that there is a lethal weapon um, of which it can kill one and you're alternating and, and you just don't seem to care if the other person lives or dies. That seems to fit the definition and the jurors agreed. Uh, so this does meet second degree homicide. Uh, but you could see why you might think it's just merely recklessness, right? That it's in fact going to drop down to this manslaughter category. But I do think, as the court is right, to look at the history here and see this type of activity we associate with a callousness, a deprivation of sort of concern, uh, no um, regard for the other person and pulling this uh, trigger. And so second degree homicide, as decided by the jury under a depraved heart theory, um, should be affirmed. And that, that's the guilty verdict that is affirmed here. Um, so that's it for our murder um, examples. Next time we'll be moving into the next level of homicide mens rea, which is manslaughter. And there's different types of manslaughter and different complexities there as well. But this gets us our MPC murder category and then the common law first and second degree murder.